Well, as I was thinking about what I wanted to submit as a topic for this conference, uh, I figured that most of you don't have to deal with icebergs and the glaciers, so perhaps you might find our uh, broken icebreaker of interest. This is a present tense situation. Uh, I'd like to tell you I have a clever solution for it, but we're working on that, and maybe I'll get to one soon. So the icebreaker, the broken icebreaker, is meant to protect our beloved and historic Copper River a million dollar bridge. It is, near, it is a nearly 1,600 foot long four span uh, Pennsylvania truss. You'll see it has two icebreakers. At that third pier, it was in shallow enough conditions that the original designers felt that uh, a really large iceberg wouldn't make it to the pier. Um, yeah. So this would be one of the offending icebergs. And incidentally, a growler is a technical term. It's a small uh, iceberg. And that's the icebreaker there. For uh, location context, this is where we're talking about in Alaska. The Copper River drains through the Chugach Mountains. They're highly glacierized, and it drains into the Gulf. The closest town is uh, Cordova, Alaska, and the Million Dollar Bridge is at mile 49, so 49 miles away from town. Uh, in an aerial view, the flow is actually in the direction towards the glacier on the left. That's the Child's Glacier. So the source of the troublesome icebergs is actually to the right. You can't see that glacier. Uh, I wanted to point out in this image that the orientation of that icebreaker relative to the pier is it's skewed. We have surmised that maybe the ori original designers uh, looked at the flow and saw that perhaps it was approaching the bridge opening at a skew and, and maybe the alignment was better served at a, uh, you know, out of alignment with the pier, but we really don't know. This is a, an image taken or a picture taken before we started noticing changes and it could have been that this icebreaker has been bumped and twisted for a long time. From the bridge, if you're looking downstream, this is what the Child's Glacier looks like, a little less than a mile away. And upstream, way off in the distance, is the Miles Glacier. Uh, it's about almost six miles away, and at the time of original construction, it was two miles closer. From the air, this is showing about half of the face of the Miles Glacier. It's about two miles wide. If I had to guess, I'd probably say that glacier face is about 150 feet high. And you can see there in the lower right, some icebergs are ready for delivery. Uh, it's not easy to get up there, and it's not cheap. I've been up, I've had the good fortune of getting up there a couple of times in the last little while, and I, and I have seen some changes at the glacier face. Don't really know what's going on here. Um, Certainly, glacier recession is nothing new in Alaska, but it looks like in the last few years we've had a fair bit of, of movement, and uh, it could be. I'm guessing maybe we're seeing we had some warm summers, and maybe we're seeing some more rapid advancement of the of the glacier, and perhaps some larger blocks breaking off. And a little dig, digging and scratching in Google Earth, you can kind of see uh, how much we lost in that between 2015 and 2017. Another very likely causal factor is the fact we have just upstream or up glacier from the face a, um, an outburst source. So we call these outburst floods yokelops. And what's happening here is the glacier is acting as, an, as a dam. This tributary valley has no way to, to drain. So what happens, it, it builds enough water to the point where either it lifts the glacier and rapidly releases or it finds a path over the top and, and then again rapidly releases as it uh, melts away a path. From the air, this is what it looks like. You can see in that lower right photograph that based upon the vegetation line, this 
reservoir is has quite a bit of capacity in it and it has when it drains the capacity of adding about 100,000 CFS into the system. So just a little bit about the Copper River. It's not small. It's the uh, sixth largest base in Alaska at 24,000 square miles. About one-sixth of that catchment area is glacierized. It's a sediment moving monster and uh, capable of discharges over 400,000 CFS. For us, let's see if I got a little, well, I don't want to touch it. If you look in the, uh, on the image on the right, most of our problems been a lot in, for DOT for a long time have been in that delta section. We have 11 miles of road that include 11 bridges, and this river is constantly changing its flow distribution between bridges, and that's been a, a source of a headache. In this case, we're looking way up at the top of the image, you can see that all of the Copper River is passing through this one million dollar bridge site. So for a little historic context, why would anyone build a facility on a, in an area like that that's so wild? Well, it turns out about 1.2 billion pounds of copper made it worth while doing. In uh, 1900, they found copper in the upper basin and shortly thereafter secured financial backing to build a a route to access that. It was 200 miles through very rugged terrain and what I consider to be awesome that was that they had uh, 273 trestles spanning about 30 miles of water and land, much of which had to be rebuilt every uh, summer because it went out with the ice. The uh, route was a railroad, so it was the uh, Copper River and Northwestern Railroad. CRNW, and they called it the Can't Run or Never Will Railroad. But it did run, and the last train ran in 1938. The U.S. government inherited the right of way in 1941, and it was a successful and financially profitable endeavor. So in 1953, the efforts began to convert the railway route into a road, and uh, in 1959, Alaska became a state, and we continued that effort all the way up until 1964, when Alaska experienced a magnitude 9.2 earthquake, which was very damaging. And on this particular route, it either toppled or damaged 28 bridges. In 1967, we sought federal assistance to rebuild the route, and in 1971, that contract was let, and we have the bridges we have now up until up into uh, mile 49 so there's a break in access after that and we've been uh, struggling to manage the bridges ever since and I'll get into that in a little bit a little bit about this bridge what I find fascinating is that the original design and the planning for a construction phasing relied on one uh, annual cycle of observation and knowing what I know about how hard it is to get out there and uh, how, how uh, uh, inhospitable it is, not to mention bears, uh, that was pretty amazing that they even got the one year, but they went ahead with a, what I think they felt was a conservative design to uh, get this built. Um, they learned things during construction. For example, when you have a bridge project near a glacier and you have nine feet of ice, thickness of ice, there's still flow underneath the ice, and that glacier has a tendency to move and surge. What they found was, as it did that, it was breaking up that ice layer, and it was actually causing an obstruction of flow. And so the ice layer at the bridge site was actually going up and down, and they had to adjust their uh, false work accordingly. And then upstream, at the Miles Glacier, if there was a large calving event, that could propagate a wave all the way down to the, to the uh, bridge site as well. So, interesting stuff. Uh, you can't talk about the billion dollar bridge without talking about this little fact. They, uh, so they had one year of observation before starting, then they had another year to watch the ice go out in the spring, and they felt pretty confident that this ice wasn't going to go out until June. They got all their steel on site in early May, 
and they, they were wise enough to think about how they could build this, and they thought, well, we could build it from both ends in a cantilevered method, or we could build it with false work. Based upon their two years of observation, they said, let's go for it, and Mother Nature decided to let the ice go a little bit earlier. So they were able to, uh, as the ice was starting to move downstream, they had everybody who was available chipping away at the ice to keep it from knocking over the false work. And they got the uh, span built, swung into place just hours before the ice went out and they lost all their false work and all their other equipment. So in the end, they saved, uh, they saved themselves about one year of delay and it was a pretty risky move, but it worked out okay. So a little bit about the icebreaker and the bridge pier. I don't know how wide this room is, but I'm thinking it's close to 60 feet. So imagine the icebreaker, head to tail, it's about as wide as this room, and I think 30 feet's probably about to the third row back there, and 28 feet's much higher than the ceiling here. So you could imagine our surprise when we heard that it was uh, damaged or broken. Um, it's just a big chunk of concrete, although there, although there are some uh, steel rail in the uh, on the facade. And in trying to decide, well, what happened out there, we considered how it was built. So it was built with pneuma pneumatic caissons, essentially a bucket upside down that's just advanced through the water and into the, the bed of the river. Um, the engineering record has some great little excerpts on this project. Two nuggets came out that maybe, um, so we were thinking the grillage, right? Between the working space of a caisson and the pier itself, there's wood. We thought maybe the wood had degraded to the point where that was causing the icebreaker to move. But it looks like they might not have kept the grillage. They might have built it in a way that they could pull that off and pour their concrete directly on the lower case on. The other thing that was interesting is that uh, they expressed some concern about a dewatering. And this was the first icebreaker of the two that they built. So it's possible that the concrete quality in that first iceberg, or icebreaker isn't as good. In any case, we're kind of scratching our heads on that. Notice uh, you can see the access into the working chamber for the caisson. That might have also offered a connection between the upper, con the upper icebreaker and the lower caisson, and I'm going to show you something on that here in a minute. So what we know about what's going on out there is in large part because of the USGS. You know, many of you know this, Alaska DOT has a very good partnership with the USGS. They're out here anyway for other stream gauging reasons, but they're always happy to pick up more data. They had a couple of uh, instrumentation uh, advantages out there like that camera that allowed us to make some comparisons when we started hearing reports of movement, such as this. So in late August 2000, uh, in uh, 2016, we started hearing word that maybe this icebreaker was moving. We were a bit skeptical, but this was one of the first image comparisons that allowed us to say, well, yeah, I think it, I think it might be moving. We've since gotten more image documentation. You can see it's on that lower right image. It's almost sideways. But that's what I was saying, that that, uh, that chamber connection might be, it might be pivoting on that. We're wondering if maybe it's not a pinned connection uh, that's allowing it to turn, but perhaps not moving. In terms of what it looks like, let's see if this works. So this is a, this is a video taken by the, there's a lodge owner on the other side of the bridge who's very concerned about the bridge, obviously, and he's provided for us a whole lot of information that's been helpful for us to get our hands around what's happening out there. If, if you look off in the distance, you can see a little white mark on the far bank. And when this ice hits it, you can see it wiggle a little, the icebreaker wiggle a little bit. Okay. Here's another one taken by our inspection staff. <laughs> and then we'll do another one here from the USGS.
So remember that icebreakers, you know, how big I told you, that's a big chunk of ice. <laughs> I didn't know that was in there. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty helpful to have the USGS out there uh, helping us be our, our eyes in the field. All right, so that's the visual documentation. We're thinking about, well, how can we quantify how much movement we're seeing out there? And uh, so we had some clever ideas using geometric tools. Uh, we thought maybe it'd be nice to get out there in the wintertime and, and install a, a, like a prism or something like that that we could reoccupy. Unfortunately, uh, it's not a guarantee that it's going to be icy all winter. In fact, this last winter, we had an open lead the whole winter long, which was a little bit perplexing. Um, going back through the files, we started, I mean, this really was not something we were thinking was a, a, a vulnerability at this bridge, but looking back in the files, you can see that we had seen some cracks in photographs uh, at the back end of the icebreaker, and somewhere along the way, somebody felt that a nose armor was necessary uh, to to protect the icebreaker. I'll tell you, these things are meant, these shark tooth designs are meant to, for ice to ride up and break and flexure. This one looks pretty blunted on the front end. So we think perhaps it's been taking more of a mom change in momentum kind of bumping than it was intended to. And a little more of photos showing that broken back end. And of course, with in consideration of where the icebreaker is at, we're starting to uh, rethink our uh, piers. Now the piers are much, much bigger, and they are landed below the, the river, riverbed quite a bit deeper. Still, I have a icebreaker that's rolling around and potentially contributing to hydraulic and scour-related processes out there. Uh, incident, incidentally, that I don't know if you saw that, but that, that caisson was landed 17 feet below the, the bed of the river. Um, that's pretty deep, but if that top rolls off, that's a pretty big hunk of concrete to induce some local scour. In terms of vulnerabilities, I do have this coded as a scour critical bridge, largely because of a report we got from the USGS a while back. But I'm not really sure that it is scour critical. It's located on a terminal moraine for the glacier. A lot of sediment is captured upstream of the bridge location, and it's one of the most stable rating curves in the state. So I think it's pretty well naturally armored. But we still have it as under item 113 as a scour critical bridge. So moving forward, we're in the process of collecting survey data and working with stakeholders in the area to watch the bridge. I mean, it's out there a ways. It's not easy to get to, so local eyes on the ground are very helpful. Uh, we don't really have any secured funding beyond planning to do anything, but at least that allows us to put a little time towards analysis. I would like to get a better handle on what's happening out there from hydraulics and even glaciologist perspective. Probably have to seek academic help for some of that, but there's questions to be answered. Uh, one of the things when you're talking about ice loads is, well, what is it that's resisting those loads, right? We have to figure out, is there, are there cracks in the icebreaker and how do we find that out? We're thinking acoustic might be one way to do it, possibly boring. Uh, I don't know that it's safe for underwater diving, but we're thinking about it. And there is a group that has a side scanning sonar that's willing to go out there for us. So perhaps as an experimental effort, we'll see how that goes. Uh, we have spent some money out there before. We repaired one of the piers. It was an expensive project. This uh, span was dropped in that 64 earthquake. We have a phase two on the books to realign the bridge and fix some of the bearings. But you'll see here in a minute, we have other things to think about before we can get going on that. And that is, we have uh, two gaps in the road before you even get to this bridge. So this million dollar bridge is technically closed. We have a sign across the road that says you can't get 
further than mile 36. Uh, enforcement of that's pretty hard, but um, nevertheless, it is a closed route. I want to show you, this is uh, at 36, we lost a, an approach embankment. Hopefully this works. Yeah. If you guys have been coming to these conferences long enough, you've probably seen a presentation on this bridge or one nearby from Mark Miles or others. This is uh, bridge 339, and we had over 50 feet of scour at that bridge. Eventually closed it. And then this was uh, the year after that last one. Watch that far, that far end embankment. It's been a, this was pretty uh, big for me, but if you go back through our files, we had almost the exact same situation on a bridge just about a mile away. Is it going to give us, oh, come on. Yeah, hopefully it'll work. If not, then I'll just tell you about it. In fact, I can just move on because I know we're on short on time. This is what it looked like before the erosion started to happen. You can see a gap at the end of the bridge just starting to develop. This is what it looked like shortly after. And if we zoom out a little further, I, you can see on the right, that's a bridge that we lengthened and tried to fix with some guide banks, but uh, it didn't. it wasn't the end all repair for hydraulics on the copper. So we still have a gap there. And I just learned last week, about one week ago, that we lost about, it looks like about 800 feet of road between mile 36 and mile 49. So anyway, we can still get out there with, by boat and by helicopter. <laughs> but I'm not sure I can get my drilled shaft out there without providing some access. Um, it's a pretty hard place to work. I want to I want to point to that upper right hand corner photo of uh, silt blown winds because it can get really uh, windy out there, and here's some uh, guide or uh, rail posts that have been exposed to that silt blown wind for a period of time. So with that, I'll I'll, I'll answer questions. All right, yeah, go ahead. Well, has it been decided? It's, it's a possibility. Uh, there, it's, it's been discussed connecting that route to the road system. So right now, Cordova has no road access. And the community itself is about 50-50 split on whether or not they want road access. So uh, <laughs> when we started pricing out the, the repair for that big gap in the road, uh, you know, it's a political decision too for a road that doesn't get a whole lot of traffic and, and the community is only partially in support. So we'll see. Incidentally, I might be uh, gaining a, a position in my group. Alaska is not for everyone, but if you're not everyone and think Alaska might be your cup of tea, give me a shout. <laughs> Good question on that too, if anyone wanted. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Mike.